Okay, folks, a couple of things before I start. One is I did send out an email about the early final. Um, remember, the, the, the early final is May 8th, two days after your project is due. You, you're really compressing things. But I do realize that some of you want to travel earlier, leave by the before the weekend. So if you want to take the early final, make sure you go into that Google shared spreadsheet that I sent you and sign up your name. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Go back and read the email because it does have the link to the Google shared spreadsheet. The final itself will be from 11.15 to 1.15 on May 8th in KMEC 170. So I've, I've, it's tough to find big rooms in finals week. So I was able to get that room. I'm happy that a lot. So I'm hoping that 100 people don't sign up because it's not good for you to take the final that close to your project. No, so do it only if you feel that you don't you don't have a choice. You can't wait till next Monday, but I will leave that choice up to you. Okay? The other thing is I wanted to update you on what's coming in the class because we're down to the last few weeks. A week from Monday is your third quiz. A week from Monday, not the coming Monday, but a week from Monday, right? It's 22nd is the third quiz. That's another 10% quiz. The final exam, of course, is May 8th or May 13th, depending on when you choose to take it. The project is due May 6th. So you can see things stacking up. And you got to work your time schedule in a way that everything doesn't happen in that last week. It just is really tough to pull off. So with those depressing thoughts, you know, let's let's get back to corporate finance. We were talking about Disney's excess debt capacity. Let me review. I mean, Disney right now has about $16 billion in debt. It includes lease debt, the market value interest bearing debt. That's how much debt they have. Based on looking at just the cost of capital and minimizing the cost of capital, they should go to about 40% debt. That's easy to say. And here's, here's something in. Percentages sometimes hide the magnitude of what you're asking a company to do. In this case, we're asking Disney to go out and borrow $39 billion and buy back stock with the $39 billion. That's a huge transaction, major consequence for the company. And if the board of directors and the management actually are doing their job, they should be asking you questions. And here are the three questions I said generically they will ask. Why should we do it? You might think the answer is obvious. Your cost of capital will go down, but you're going to see very quick. It's not a very great, very good sales pitch. It doesn't have a hook to it. Why should we do it? Second, what if something goes wrong? In this case, everything boils down to that operating income. This is an earnings-based approach to determining how much you can borrow, as opposed to what? An asset-based approach. I'm not borrowing based on how much I have in assets. I'm borrowing based on what I can service with my earnings. So what can go wrong is really about what, what, what happens if my earnings drop by 30% or 50%. What could cause that? A dozen different things, right? It could be a macro event, a recession, a, 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 a COVID a pandemic, something shuts down. It could be a micro event, something happening at the company. What if something goes wrong? And third, this whole process seems to be built around assuming that when you borrow money, you buy back stock. I told you the mechanical reasons why we do it, because we want to isolate the effect of the financing mix changing. But companies have big plans. In the case of Disney in 2013, they were building their Shanghai plant still, a couple of billion dollars there. They wanted to expand their Avengers franchise movie making, another billion dollars. It seems silly to pay this out, you know, borrow money and pay this out to stockholders and then have to go out and raise capital again. So it's legitimate for companies to say, hey, what if I have great investment plans? Can I take this excess debt capacity you told me I have and use it on those investment plans? So these are questions you will face with any underlevered company and you should face them. Let's start with the first question. Why should we do it? Remember, if you if you do this, your cost of capital goes down. But I told you about how little, right? It goes from 7.81% down to 7.16%. That's a 0.65% drop in cost of capital. And play, play it out. You're in the front of the, front of the board of directors of Disney. 
and you tell them, look, you need to borrow $39 billion, already they're shocked. And buy back stock, even more shocked. And then you say, you do this because your cost of capital dropped by 0.65%. You know what the reaction is going to be, right? You want us to do what? To get what? It sounds completely disproportionate. Cost of capital don't move much. So your first job is to make it real money. To translate for the company what a 65, in the, a 65 basis point drop in the cost of capital mean. So here's one way to do it. Remember, the cost of capital is your discount rate in valuing the firm. You can value the firm with the old cost of capital and then revalue to the new cost of capital. The only problem is you're in the capital structure section. You're not in the valuation section yet, right? So you're saying, well, how am I going to value the company without doing all the dirty work of actually projecting our earnings and cash flows? I'll give you a shortcut, and I'll also tell you the limitations of the shortcut. In the shortcut, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by taking the existing enterprise value of the firm, which I can observe, market value of equity plus debt minus cash is $133 billion. I know the existing free cash flow. I can compute that by taking after-tax operating income, subtracting out the net capex and change in working capital in the most recent year. And then I solve for what cost of capital or, or what growth rate will give me the enterprise value today. Because I know the cash flow, I know the value, I know the current cost of capital, I solve for the growth rate. Hang in there with me. That growth rate is a solved number. Think of it as an implied growth rate. Given Disney's value today, that's what the growth rate, the market is attaching. What if I go to my new debt ratio? My free cash flow doesn't change. Why doesn't it change? Because what did I do with the, with all the cash I brought in? I paid it out of the other window. So my EBIT is the same. My tax rate is the same. My CapEx, nothing is changing in my operations. My free cash for the firm is the same. My growth rate doesn't change. That's growth in operating income. It has nothing to do with how much debt I have. I plug in the new cost of capital. The value that I get is $172.3 billion. If you believe this computation, going to my new debt ratio will increase my value by $39 billion. I don't believe this computation. I'll tell you why. This is a stable growth model, right? Remember, we introduced when we used the when we used the perpetual growth equation. We said you can use it only if the growth rate can be sustained forever. Four point nine four percent is not a growth rate that you can sustain forever. How can I be so categorical about it? When I did this, the risk-free rate was you know two point seven five percent. If you're growing at 4.94%, you're growing at a rate faster than the economy, the company is going to blow up and take the economy down with it. Yes, Zach? A second ago, you said the cash flow doesn't change at all. Is that, do you... It's a pre-debt cash flow, right? Free cash flow to the firm is pre-debt. So no matter how much debt I take, remember, I'm looking at operating income. Operating income is operating income. The tax rate is the tax rate. So take all of the ingredients that go into free cash flow to the firm. Everything there is a pre-debt number. So I could be at 95% debt, and those numbers are still going to be those numbers. That's like the debt, equity, is the Exactly, right. It does change that cash flow, but not the market. The free cash flow to equity will change. But free cash flow to the firm is a pre-debt cash flow. It will not change as the debt ratio changes, right? Yes. It's not a terminal value. We use it a terminal value. Right? If you have a stable growth firm, this is the value today. The reason we you see this as a terminal value calculation is most of the time you're valuing companies where the growth rate is not in steady state yet. Right, So there is no requirement in discounted cash flow valuation that you need a high growth period. You can be Toyota to value today. I'd value it with one stable growth model. So the this is just a pre growing perpetuity equation. You can use it on any growing perpetuity. So if you have a mature firm today, you can just value it in one step. It, the terminal value is your value today because there is no high growth period. But in discounted cash flow valuations, you do tend to see this in year five or year 10 because usually you have a front window of higher growth. And that's what I'm arguing. Maybe that, that's the problem here is I'm imposing a terminal value model on a company that still has some high growth left. So what's the way around it? I'll give you what I think is a much more pragmatic way to calculate the change in firm value. 
I know we don't think of the cost of capital in this way, but the cost of capital is the cost that you face in financing your company on an annual basis today. So today, if you look at Disney's cost of capital, it's 7.81%. Their enterprise value is 133.9 billion. So if you think about the annual financing costs, the annual financing cost they face right now is 10.46 billion. You're saying, where would I see this in the financial statements? Most of it you will not see because the interest portion you will see, but the rest of it is cash flows to equity and God only knows where you will end up seeing it. But this is how much you're paying to finance a firm today. You go to a 7.16% cost of capital, the cost of financing the firm on an annual basis is 9,592 million, 7.16% cost of capital. The change, 866 million is how much you will save each year it's an annual saving by going to the lower cost of capital. Now I can be consistent, say, look, this is a stable growth. It's a growing perpetuity. I'm going to cap that growth rate at the risk-free rate. Remember that shortcut that we used as a proxy. The present value of 866 million growing at 2.75% is 19.6 billion. This is magical. Why is it magical? The company is exactly the same. Same theme park, same movies, same businesses. No, nothing has changed in operations. All I changed was the mix of debt and equity. And the value of the business went up by 19.6 billion. It's actually too good to be true. You are increasing the value of the firm. But I'm going to ask you a philosophical question about where these savings are coming from. Because the next time you meet an LBO guy who talks about how much value is created, I want you to remember this. Where is this 19.6 billion in magical value showing up from? What's causing that value? And why did my cost of capital get lower? Okay, let's go. Let's keep going. Why did the cost of debt, it's not just the cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity. No, that's not it either. It's that I multiply the cost of debt by a one minus tax rate. This is entirely coming from tax savings. I'll put more cynically, you know what this is? It's a wealth transfer from taxpayers to companies that borrow money. I'm not going to take issue with the companies. They didn't write the tax law. You wrote the tax law. Guess what? People take, take advantage of that. This entire, so if you have an entire economy where the only thing that's happening is companies are changing the financing mixes, the stockholders in these companies will get wealthier, right? But the overall economy will not grow because there is no wealth being created. Wealth for an economy has to come from operations changing. Zach? I think it's from here, from the growth side, we talked about the like 4% growth rate, uh, growth rate with a sustainable long term. Right. I don't think, I'm just trying to, I don't understand the connection between that and what we've done here. Well, basically I've capped the growth rate at the risk-free rate, which is sustainable. So while the 4.8 something percent that I backed out of the value cannot be sustained forever, a growth rate that's equal to the risk-free rate is actually a sustainable growth rate. Ten, the 10 years, same, the same risk-free rate I used to get my cost of equity shows up now as my cap on my growth rate. And so the concept you're showing here is before, when it was 4%, it was, it was a very high number. No, that's it. So don't compare the two pages. Basically, I'm saying that calculation overstates increase in value because I'm taking a 4.8% growth rate in perpetuity, which cannot be sustained, and forcing it in an equation, which essentially was designed for stable growth, a growth you can sustain forever. So the 39 billion you saw on the previous page was overstated. I'm saying, let me get a more realistic estimate by putting a cap on that growth rate of 2.7. That's what the 19 billion is with the cap imposed. Exactly. So this is the number that I would present to the board, not the 39 billion. Yes. That's that's a complete illusion. The way you can show it is that there's that spread, but that spread is going to be exactly offset or more by the fact that both the cost of equity and the cost of debt will go up as you take advantage of the spread. 
until you unless you bring the tax savings there is no benefit it is the tax savings that is creating the benefit and i'll show it to you know in a moment you go uh, go back to the optimal capital structure and you change the tax rate from i use 36 percent down to zero percent you know what the optimal debt ratio for disney becomes zero without the tax benefit there is no increased value debt can create and and it's common sense right how can borrowing money create wealth for an overall economy? All it does is it changes claims on operations. I'm not saying again, I'm not taking a moral or an ethical position here, but I'm saying an economy is in big trouble if all you see are people playing with the liability side of the balance sheet, changing financing mixes, and nothing is changing in terms of factories built or projects taken or operations changing. Yes. You will not. It, you're taking it real growth. Risk-free rates are nominal, right? Risk-free rates will always exceed the real growth rate. And what's the difference going to be? Expected inflation, right? So don't compare this to the real GDP growth. It's nominal GDP growth you're looking at. And in the long term, the risk-free rate happens to be a better proxy for nominal GDP growth than any estimate you will see out there. And that's basically why I'm using it as my cap on my growth rate. Okay. So think about that. Again, I'm not arguing against debt, but I'm saying that this is something that has to be thought through in terms of economic policy for governments. If you, you, know, you increase tax rates, you're gonna encourage the use of debt. That might actually end up being good for equity investors in highly levered companies. But from the operating standpoint, you're not creating a dollar in value. So, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Let's keep it in percentage. It makes it even worse when you say 0 0.0781. Let's say 7.81% to 7.16%, yeah. That's exactly why it's shifting down, right? Because what's happening when I'm, when I'm tripling the debt? I'm replacing more expensive equity with cheaper debt, right? It, it's a small shift because it's very difficult to change the overall cost of capital because there's an offsetting effect. As I replace more expensive equity with cheaper debt, I made both riskier, right? The equity became riskier because I now have a more risky equity claim. The debt became riskier because you're now a riskier company of three times the debt that you used to have. So what you have here is, an, if I did not bring in the offsetting effect, the cost of capital would have dropped to 5.8%. It would look magical. My value would, you know, quote, but that's not reality. Your, when you change your debt ratio, your cost of equity and your cost of debt have to change to reflect the higher risk in the company. That's why the effect is relatively small is because I'm being realistic in what will this do to my risk as an equity investor and as a lender. Now, what's uh, how do I do this though? I borrow 36 billion, I 39 billion, I buy back stock, right? What's what does that even mean? Buy back 39 billion dollars worth of stock. No. What are the different ways a company can buy back stock? Let's go through the ways. One is can slip in and out of markets, buying a few shares here, a few shares there, essentially. When you're buying, if you're buying just 500 million of your stock, you can do that, you know, it's, it, it's market transactions. When you're buying 39 billion, you have to treat it like a merger. You've got to make a tender offer for your own shares. You know what a tender offer is, right? You know, in the old days, you take out a full page ad if you're a Disney and say, if you're a Disney shareholder, if you tender your shares before April 31st, we will pay you X dollars per share for those shares. Now, the question I want to ex examine is, what should that X be? Because you're the company, you have to put a number there. The stock price at the time that I did this was $67.71. Let's try an experiment. Let's say, I have, let's say I take a full page ad in the Wall Street Journal and say, hey, Disney shareholder, if you tender your shares back, I will pay you $67.71. How many people are going to tender their shares? 
None, because that's the existing stock price, right? So almost by definition, what do I have to do? I have to offer a premium. And this is where you can't trust your bankers to set that premium. Because what's a banker's end game? To get the buyback done, right? And how do you get the buyback done easily? By pushing the price up more. From their perspective, they're going to set whatever price. But from your perspective, there is an upper bound, right? Because if you pay too high a price, you're taking money away from the shareholders who remain in your firm to, and transferring it to those you know, shareholders, those disloyal shareholders who are selling their shares and moving on. So I'm going to ask a question, which I think every company that does buybacks has to ask and get answered. What is a fair price for the buyback? You see, what does it even mean to be fair? Here's what I want you to do. I want you guys to be the, the ones who sell your shares back to Disney. And the rest of you are going to be shareholders who remain as shareholders in Disney. What's the essence of fairness? Everybody in this room has to get the same piece of the gain in value, right? The gain in value, if you remember, is 19.6 billion. There are 1.8 million shares outstanding in Disney. You divide that 19.6 by 1. I'm sorry, 1.8 billion. I get an increase in value per share of 1090. If I pay a ten dollar and ninety cent premium or a stock price of seventy eight sixty one, here's what will happen: the people who sell their shares back to me will get a ten dollar and ninety cent premium. They walk away happy. The people who remain in the firm will get a ten point nine premium. That's why I'm dividing by the total number of shares. That to me is the essence of fairness. But life is not fair. The world is not a fair place. Most of the time, the buyback price is going to be different from the fair price. So let's think about you know, what, what that will do when you pay a buyback price different from 7881. Let's go through the process of what the remaining shareholders in the firm will be left with. First, I'm going to take how much debt I have and divide it by whatever share price you choose to pay. $80, $75, 70 So pick the price. That's going to tell me how many shares I buy back in the buyback, right? What happens to the shares that I buy back? I burn them in a bonfire. They're gone. The, num the share count will decrease. But remember, when I buy back those shares, I am passing some of the gain on to them. I calculate how much of the gain I'm going to pass on. But basically, what I, as an equity investor, left in the firm will get is whatever of the 19.6 billion, whatever is not being paid out becomes my share of the gain. I mean, if you cut it down to basics, the break-even price is seventy-eight eighty-one, and I pay a higher price than that, then you as the loyal shareholders, the remaining shareholders will lose, and the people who sell their shares back will gain. What's your best case scenario as a shareholder is planning to stay on in the firm? What would you love the company to be able to do? Buy back at the lowest price you can, right? What if I could buy back at the market price of sixty-seven seventy-one? You say, why would they do that? Let's, you know, at, in 2013, there were a couple of large Disney shareholders. I think the Bass Brothers, Texas, you know, who owned lots of shares in Disney and they had liquidity problems. What if you approach them and say, look, we'll buy your shares back. You don't have a price impact in the market. You know, I know it's, un, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a stretch, but let's say you could do that. Let's work out what will happen to the remaining shareholders if I was able to buy the shares back at 67.71. So I took the the thirty nine billion divided by sixty seven seventy one. Turns out I buy back one point two two one. I'm sorry. Well, I I, I buy what's left is one point two two one million shares out of the one point eight million shares. My enterprise value with the increase in value is one fifty three five thirty one. I subtract out the new debt I will have after the buyback. And when I divide by the remaining shares outstanding, I get a value per share of 83.78. So the people who sold their shares back got 67.71. The people who remained in the company got 83.78. When you get a chance, here's what I'd like you to try. Try an $80 stock price, a buyback. Give me at least a sense of direction. If I buy back shares at $80 and you work through the process, the people who sell their shares back will get $80. But what will your value per share be? 
it's going to be less than the 7781 because you now get is there a price that i could pay on the buyback where you end up with nothing What if I raise it to 90, 9,500? There will be a tipping point where the entire 19.6 billion will get paid out to the people who sell their shares back, which means you're left with nothing at the end. Now do you see why when you do buybacks, those buybacks always need to come at the cap? You're saying, what if I can't buy the shares back at what was the break-even price, 78.61? Don't. There's a different way in which you can end up with the the uh, the outcome you wanted. It's, so let's say that the, own, the banker comes back and says, I can't buy back the shares for less than 85. That's the best I can do. What is the other way in which you can reduce equity? The reason we're doing the buyback is to reduce the equity, right? What's the other way we, we talked about that you could reduce equity? Pay a, pay a special dividend. Have you ever held a stock which pays, when you get a special, you know, regular dividends, like 50 cents, a dollar, dollar 50. On a special dividend, you will get a $20 dividend per share, a one-time cash deal. I don't know whether there's a message in here and there, but I don't want to know what it is. So, <laughs> so you could pay a special dividend. I think companies lock themselves up into these buybacks and their objective becomes, I want to do a buyback at any price. And guess what? If that's your objective, you will get the buyback done at the wrong price, end up leaving your remaining shareholders worse off. Yes, Zach? I thought we were trying to do the buyback to get like cash to fund. No, no. In fact, what did we say? The, all of the money that comes in goes out, right? We haven't even looked at In fact, that's the third question. What if I want to take projects? All of financing mix you know, analyses that we do keeps the company constant. So whatever you borrow either goes out as a buyback or as a special dividend. Why are we wanting to reduce the equity? And if we can do it- Because it lowers the cost of capital. It gives you a bigger tax advantage. Because of the debt tax. Exactly. It, but it, 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 it's a tax advantage. Basically, we're saying same company, more debt, I get a bigger tax advantage now, that's why I called it a pure wealth transfer, right? It's a wealth transfer from taxpayers to the companies that borrow money. Yes. Right. We'll talk about that because so we'll talk about what happens because that's a legitimate question, right? Because here you're saying, why am I taking all this money, putting it out when I have all these investment plans to make? Here I'm doing it purely because I want to focus on just the financings, right? Because if I brought in projects, I have two things going on, right? So when the value changes, I don't know whether it's changing because my debt mix changed or because I took a great project. Here, I want to isolate the financing mix issue. But you're right, that is a legitimate question that every company should have because it seems silly to borrow money, buy back stock, and then raise money for a new theme park, right? Yes. NOLs. Let's say you have three years worth of NOLs. How should you approach something like this? Help me out intuitively. What's the biggest benefit of debt? Tax payers. So help if you have five hundred billion dollars in NOLs, how much should you borrow? Don't. What the heck are you borrowing money for? Your tax benefit is not there. So a company that has billions of dollars in NOL that goes out and borrows money, my reaction is, what's wrong with you guys? Right, because you, they can't. You, you're clearly not using a rational reason. You must be, oh, debt is cheaper than equity. I remember when Tesla issued debt, raised debt in 2016. I said somebody's on drugs here. It doesn't make any sense. You're a money losing company with big NOLs. There's no tax benefit. You think maybe it'll make me more disciplined? Come on. Do you think Musk is going to say, you know what, the next project, let's be a little more disciplined. We have a lot of debt due. There's no good reason, and you have a host of bad reasons, right? You've taken a company with immense amount of potential and put it at risk. Why, for $5 billion in debt? And you have your excuses, I can't raise equity. Come on, you are Tesla. You are already a $200 billion company. Investors were lining up to give you money. So I went looking for the name of the CFO. 
I couldn't even find it. That That's revealing about the company itself. You know, I have no idea how decisions got made, but it made absolutely no sense. Yes. One being a special difference and the other being a no, no, no. You decrease the mark because the minute the special dividend gets paid, guess what happens to your stock price? No, it's not being. It's it's real because if you didn't happen, I would arbitrage my way to become a billionaire, right? If the stock price doesn't drop by a $20 special dividend, you know what people do. They line up, buy the shares before the special dividend, collect the $20. So, it is one of the few things in markets that's completely predictable. When big special dividends get paid, the stock price drops almost exactly by that amount because otherwise you'll have arbitrage opportunities for people who buy the shares before collect the special dividend and then get the high price at the end. Okay. So it's a market value effect, but it's a different kind of market value effect. And as a Disney shareholder, what might lead you to pick one over the other? Either way, cash leaves the company, right? For a Disney shareholder, what is the impact on you of the two? What, what, what difference are you going to notice? On the buybacks, whether you cashed out or not was your choice, right? It was optional. And you might have chosen because you needed the cash now. You thought that this is a high price. But when you have a special dividend, you're going to get the check in the mail, whether you like it or not, which is the good news. But the bad news is that year when you do your taxes, God help you. Because you're now going to have to pay taxes on that special dividend. So there's a tax consequence with special dividends that you might not have with stock buybacks. We talk about that as a reason one might pick one over the other. But either way, from the company's perspective, the equity will shrink. Your debt ratio will go up. You've accomplished what you set out to accomplish. Now, earlier I gave you that, that perfect price, 78.61, just to show you that that works. I took the 39.175 billion, I take a new debt, divided by seven. I want to prove that if I buy back shares at 78.61, what you're left with is also what 78.61. So you work through the process, I pay 78.61, my share count goes to 1,301.65. I trace through the process, the shares left over are also what 78.61. So the shortcut works where you take the change in value and divide it by the total number of shares outstanding, even though some of them will be bought back. So why should we do it? 19.6 billion. As a subtext, how should we do it? You can either do a buyback if you can pull it off and buy back shares at 78.61 or less, or you can do a special dividend and accomplish exactly the same objective. Let's go to the second stop. What if something goes wrong? Debt has a downside. There's a dark side to borrowing. Or if you think of it as a two-edged sword, there, there's a sharp edge coming at you. And it comes at you when bad things happen to your company. So there are a couple of ways you can ask this what-if question about your company. So let's say you come up with the optimal debt ratio of your company given 2023 operating income. You come up with 30%. But your company had a really good 2023. If you wanted to figure out what a bad year would look like for your company, a recession, an economic slowdown. If your company's been around enough, you know what you're going to do, right? You're going to go back in time. So what did the last recession do to my company? How much did operating income drop? Because ultimately, this is all about the operating income. The operating income drops, your optimal debt ratio will decrease. So the first approach, you can ask, what if the operating income drops by 10%, 20%, 30%? 30 and looking at history, you say, what is a reasonable number for a bad year for this company? I will do that for this. The second is you can try to do scenario analysis. What if the economy goes into recession? What will the, so you know, think about it as probabilities and estimate what the optimal debt ratio will be under different scenarios. So those approaches, you're working with the operating income. There's another way you can bring in your constraints, your worries about the downside. I told you Disney's optimal debt ratio. You had a question? Are you doing a firm valuation or an equity value? Firm valuation, you could free cash for the firm, pre-debt cash flows, those don't change. 
What's the only place the financing mix shows up in a firm valuation? You'll get a different value per share, but the overall value of equity will be the same. But you should get two different values per share, right? Because the special dividend, each of us has a $20 bill in our pocket. We got as a special dividend. The value per share should be roughly $20 lower in the special dividend case. That, but it doesn't make you worse off, right? Because you ha you collected the cash, and this is now going to be the value per share with the cash in your pocket. So in a DCF valuation, everything will look the same. Free cash flow to the firm, you discount back at, a, at this new cost of capital, the new debt mix, you know? but you will have more shares outstanding with a special dividend and lower value per share, but an offsetting effect of cash in your pocket. Yeah. The other way you can bring what-if analyses is by looking at your rating. I told you Disney's optimal was 40%. I don't know whether you even noticed what the bond rating for Disney was at that ratio. It looked like I almost didn't care, right? It's our lowest cost of capital. I'll fill it in. Their, act, their bond rating at the optimal was, I think, single A. But what if the bond rating had been double B? Do you see where I'm going, right? Your optimal debt ratio is 40%. What if I told you that if you went to that 40%, your bond rating will drop to double B. Might that give you pause in deciding whether to borrow the money? Why? Yeah, go ahead. Future. Forget about the future. Right now, what happens? What's a, what's a news story going to be in the Wall Street Journal the next day? Rating drops to double B. Forget about the investor side, the operation side. Remember we talked about indirect bankruptcy costs? You drop to double B, all kinds of bad things are going to start happening in Burbank. Suppliers are going to call you and say, you know what, Disney, we'll take cash. We know that credit we used to, that was 60. Disney employees are going to read that and say, oh my God, we might not be around in a couple of years. So let me look at Warner and maybe Amazon is hiring, maybe Netflix is hiring. This part, so you can see why many companies have an investment grade constraint, which is give me my optimal debt ratio, but subject to a minimum bond rating. We don't want to drop below, what's the investment grade bond rating? What's the level? It's triple B in, in S&P, BAA in Moody's. So that's, historically, that's the dividing line. We'll talk about how that dividing line has become fuzzier over time, but in the in the last century, if you drop below investment grade, your access to capital got dropped off and then all kinds of bad things started to happen to you as a company. But some companies will set their rating above that investment grade. Why? Just to give them buffer, right? Triple B are already at the edge once the price can produce. So maybe A minus, maybe even single A. We'll talk about what happens when managers set completely unrealistic ratings constraint. We want to be AAA at any cost. You can give them the rating, but then you got to give them the bill on this is what it's going to cost you. But the second approach you put in a rating constraint. So let's talk about the what if analysis. What's the question you're trying to answer? Hey, I'm looking at the optimal debt ratio for Disney. I'm using 2013 numbers. It was a good year. What if something bad happens? In the case of Disney, you have a long history, right? So I went back and collected their operating income for the last 25 years. And I look for what the worst year there was. And as you go through, you can see the worst year they've had, at least leading to 2013, was in 2000, their operating income dropped by about 30%. I don't even really know what happened. And I, it, I really don't care because now I have a sense of what a bad year for Disney will look like. Maybe 15%, maybe 20%, 30% is an awful year. When you do this for your company, if it's Dell computers, you're going to see much more variation than in Disney. It's a technology company. A bad year for a technology company might be a 50% drop in operating income. If you're doing this for Con Ed, a regulated utility, a bad year for Con Ed might be a 5 or a 10% drop in operating income. That's the advantage of being a regulated utility. You see, when you ask the what-if questions, you have to gauge them based on what your company looks like. In fact, I looked at the last few you know, recessions and at least in, uh, through 2013, they, you know, they had they, they drops in three of those 20%, 20%. I'm getting a sense of what a bad year looks, for, looks like for Disney. 
So here's what I did. I went back to the optimal debt ratio calculation and I remember the starting number, the, it's in, in, I have the starting number. I took the 2013 operating income and dropped it by 10%. You know what happened to my optimal? Nothing. 20%, nothing. 30%, nothing. 40%, my optimal starts to drop. Now, I always do this when I compute the optimal debt ratio for a company. Because there will be at least one person, hopefully, in the audience, in the management group, who's conservative, who's careful, who's prudent. And you need one. If there's no person in there who's conservative, you walk out of that room because that company is going to do things you shouldn't do. And they're going to say, look, you know, this is dangerous. What if something bad happens? Whip out this table and say, okay, you know what? Bad things can happen. But even if you had the worst year you've had in the last 30 years, you still have excess debt capacity. You might not go all the way to 40%, but effectively this shows there's a lot of buffer built in at least for Disney. When you do this for your company, if you drop your operating income by 10%, if your optimal goes back from 40 to 20%, you know what you should do? You should tell the company to borrow only 20%. Your objective is not to come up with that Excel spreadsheet optimal. It's to design a debt ratio that your company can survive with and prosper with in the long term. It's a tool. It's not telling you what to do. It's giving you ammunition that you can use to decide what to do. So in the what-if analysis, you let the operating income change, and the operating income changes, you can see the buffer built in. On the ratings process, basically you're trying to get from the management what their rating constraint is. Is it triple B, is it single A, is it double A? The higher, so let's start with the obvious. The higher the ratings constraint, the less you can borrow. So I understand, you know, I understand the investment grade rating. I even understand a single A. But as I said, once in a while, you will get a management that says, we want a triple A rating. Why? We want to be the only triple A rated company in the, in the sector. I remember a conversation I had almost 20 years ago with the CEO of a steel company in Europe. It's the last AAA rated steel company in the world. So I said, what is this fixation you have with the AAA rating? He said, that's obvious. We can borrow money at a really low rate. I said, that's interesting. How much do you borrow? He said, we don't borrow money. That's the way we preserve our AAA rating. This is the kind of circular logic that really drives companies to never borrow money. Of course, you impose a AAA rating, you can keep the rating, but the only way you can keep that rating is by never borrowing money. What's the point? So one of the things you have to be ready for is when the management gives you a rating constraint that's unrealistic, you got to give them a bill. What does that mean? What do you do when you put a ratings constraint into an optimization process? You've introduced a constraint, right? You can cost out that constraint and say, this is what the constraint will cost you. So let's take Disney. Disney's actual rating at a 40% debt ratio was single A. So if they said, look, we need an investment grade rating, I'd say, you're okay. 40%, you're still going to have an investment grade rating. But let's suppose they came back and said, we want a double A rating. Then I have to stop at 30%. Basically, all I do is I go back to the spreadsheet, look at 0, 10, 20, and I have to stop when my rating gets below this. At a 30% debt ratio, my value is going to be lower because my cost of capital is going to be higher, almost by definition, because I'm not at the optimum. I take the difference in value between my unconstrained optimal and my constrained optimal. I come up with a difference of 5.7 billion. What does that mean? Uh, if you put in a double A ratings constraint, it's going to cost not you, the company, but your shareholders. Let's be very clear. It's not the company that's bearing this cost. It's the shareholders of 5.7 billion. You want a triple A rating? It's going to cost your shareholders 12.1 billion. Turn the onus back on them. Say, get in front of your shareholders, tell them why you want to pay 12 billion to have bragging rights at the last triple A rated company in the business. There's nothing inherently amazing about a triple A rating. There are only about a dozen AAA rated companies we know that that can you know that know their rating is going to be preserved going forward. But putting in that rating will create a cost. Yeah. Shareholders actually pay attention to these things. Like this. Very much so, because when you see debt equity for trade-offs, you see stock prices react very strongly. But like the, the con 
concept of maybe the steel thing was unique, but you know they're trying to preserve a rating. They, they might see shareholder. Very few shareholders computing costs of capital, optimizing costs of capital, right? But they know when you have too little debt. Right. The question is, who draws their attention to it, right? Because you're, I mean, you're a shareholder. You have a life to live. You're a doctor. You're an engineer. You're a dentist. You invest in a company. You don't even think about optimal debt ratios. So who brings this into your consciousness that a company has too little debt? And this is why I call activists the laxatives markets need, right? Because without them, you're sitting there saying oblivious to the fact that companies are being run by, by managers for their comfort. So for a long time in Europe, nobody ever talked about, it. do we have too much debt or too little debt? Because nobody brought it to the attention of shareholders. Now that's passed. So it's true, most shareholders are oblivious to how much companies have, but there are pressures that build up as a company matures. You know, the other thing that gives companies away is when you have too little debt and you have a lot of cash flows coming in, your cash balance starts ballooning out, right? That I notice. Why does Apple have 160 billion cash? Why does Google, that's another signal that leads people to reassess, should this company be borrowing more money? That, that's part of why for the project in the corporate governance, you have us look at the potential yeah. impact. So when you, so let's suppose in that part of the corporate governance part, when you looked at your company, you decided shareholders have no power in this company for lots of different reasons. You come to the capital structure part and you notice that your company is at 2% debt, it's optimal is 30%. Now, first reaction is, why would a company do that? The answer actually is in the corporate governance section. Left to themselves, managers actually don't want debt. It makes their lives uncomfortable. They're going to borrow very little. They're going to, you know, it, it cushions them. You know? So I think that everything ties back to, you know, whose interests are being served. Are managers running the company for themselves? Are they running the company for shareholders? So in this case, basically, you know, I, at single A rating, I feel pretty comfortable. But if I did have a rating constraint, I'd cost it out and give it to me. Now let's get the question that kind of has been lurking in the background. All of this is built on the premise that I borrowed $39 billion and I buy back stock or pay a special dividend. So Disney's, you know, Disney's management says, but we have all these great investment plans. What if we take this excess debt capacity and use it to build more theme parks, make more movies? Will the optimal debt ratio calculation you did hold? You know, well, it depends on what you're investing in. If you stay in your existing business lines, more theme parks, more movies, it holds. But now it'll be 40% of a much bigger firm. So now you're going to be borrowing money, building a new theme park. And what are you hoping for? That the earnings from those theme parks will now supplement your existing earnings. Your earnings will grow pro proportionately and with the same risk as the rest of your business. So if you're going to just grow your business and that's what you're taking the money for. I'm okay with you using that 40% debt ratio, not buying back stock or paying a dividend, but using it to take projects. But what if in 2019, Bob Chaper came to you and said, look, you told us we have excess debt capacity. I'm planning to make this huge investment in Disney Plus, the streaming business. In fact, take the entire 39 billion. I'm going to make new content like it's going out of style. Would you have concerns about that choice? What is it about that investment that will lead you to say, no, you can't do that? First, in terms of uh, in terms of earnings and cash flows, what kind of business is the streaming business? Ne negative earnings, huge negative cash flows. It's a young business, right? It's not because it's a bad business. It's a young business. If I take pro businesses that are negative earnings and negative cash flows and I add them to a company, what should happen to my optimal debt ratio? Should I be able to borrow more or less? I should be able to borrow less. So if you're entering into business that are riskier, more negative earnings, younger, I'm going to break your optimal down. I can actually compute what your new optimal should be if you can tell me what business you're entering into. You can't give companies blank checks and say, hey, you have excess debt capacity, do whatever you want, because they will. And in the process, they will actually eliminate the reason you told them you could borrow money in the first place. 
So can you take projects? Absolutely. But I need to know what the projects are so I can make that judgment on, you know, earnings, cash flows and risk, because otherwise you're going to be taking riskier, more negative earnings businesses than your existing businesses and your optimal will decrease. So that was Disney and you saw that extended process. I'm not going to torture you by doing every one of my companies all through, but I did my optimal debt ratio for each of my other company. With each one, I'm going to focus on one aspect because the mechanics are the same, right? I change the debt ratio. I compute a new cost of equity. I look for the lowest cost of capital. I did this for Tata Motors. The optimal debt ratio is 20%. They were at 29%. They were over levered. Now, it's not different enough that I'm going to freak out. It's not like the optimal is 0%, they're at 29%. But they are over level. And when I did this across the Tata group, I did Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals, Tata Motors, Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals were all over level. What were they doing? They were borrowing money and many were doing big acquisitions with that debt. And it looked like each of them was borrowing too much money. But then I looked at Tata Consulting Services, which is the largest company in the Tata Group, a young growth company with, I'm sorry, it's not a young, it's an older growth company with huge earnings and cash flows. It's an outsourcing company. Its debt ratio is like 2%. Its optimal is 20%. You're one really large company that's significantly underlevered and four or five or six more mature Tata companies that are over levered. I mean, here, I, I don't know what's happening, but here's what I guess is happening. When Tata Motors goes into a bank to borrow money, let's say it's not corporate bonds, the banker is looking at the financials saying, you're going to be really stretched with this debt, it looks like. And then you know what the banker is going to say, but you're part of the Tata group. They're not going to let you go under. They will find a way to pay off the debt. You're effectively letting companies borrow on other companies. So, you know who should be really pissed off about this? Which of these, which of the share, in which of the companies are should shareholders be pissed off about this cross subsidization that's going on? Who's winning and who's losing? The targets, the TCS shareholders are the losers because their debt capacity, which should have given them the tax benefits, is now being used by Tata Motors, Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals to fund their operations. Again, a corporate governance issue, right? That family group, I said, it's going to come back. You see that play out when you look at the optimal debt ratio. So if any of you are doing family group companies, you find them under levered or over levered, you might want to step back and look at the family group and say, hey, may you don't have to do optimals in every one of the companies. It's a lot of work, but at least you can get a sense of why the optimal is different from the actual. Yeah, yes. It doesn't have to be off the books. Everything is, the subsidies are happening. They're all on the books. You can see the debt. The only problem is the bankers are lending on another company's assets. So, which is an extremely dangerous thing to do. But it's probably not unrealistic, right? Family groups find a way to let companies pay off the debt. Then I looked at Vale, iron ore mining company. And this is probably going to be, what I say about Vale will be true about any commodity company. Based on their existing operating income, their optimal debt ratio is about 30% debt, 70% equity. They were at not 39, 40% debt. So at first sight, they looked over level. So actually, you know, I, I did this in a class and a, to, a couple of weeks later, I get a call from the CF, the finance group at Vale, somebody who'd seen the class. And he said, you know, we I saw your session on us being over levered. I don't think we are. And he gave me his rationale. And this is a rationale you hear often from commodity companies. He said, last year's earnings were depressed because iron ore prices were low. And iron ore prices go up and down. If we looked at more normalized earnings, we can afford to borrow more. I said, you're right. Now, how would you factor that in if you're looking at a commodity company and you're coming up with an optimal? That optimal reflects the earnings you put in, right? That earnings comes from 2023. How would you factor in the fact that commodity prices move in cycles and earnings can go up? And let's say you're doing an oil company. 2023 earnings will give you too high an optimal. Why? Because oil prices start to go up that year. You're going to see that. In fact, 2024 looks like it's also going to deliver good numbers for oil companies. 
So one way you can do this is look at an average earnings across time. Again, it's not rocket science. You're trying to bring in the fact that prices go up and down. And when I use the average earnings that Vale had over time, their optimal debt ratio jumped to 50%. Does it mean that anything goes? No. If you're borrowing more than your current earnings can sustain and you're trusting the cycle will bail you out, you know what can get you into trouble, right? Is a cycle doesn't bail you out. I think it's dangerous. As a, you know, I would do what Exxon Mobil does. Exxon Mobil has about 13% debt. It borrows money based on the lowest oil price it thinks you can get. So basically, it does the optimal with the lowest earnings you can get with the, with the, with the $20 oil price. You think that's so conservative. That's why they've been around 100 years. In contrast, if you look at what the shale oil companies did, they borrowed up to the hilt when oil prices were $120 a barrel. And guess what happened to most of them in 2020? They either crashed and burned or got very close to crashing and burning. I think as a long-term commodity companies, you can learn more by looking at ExxonMobil and Royal Dutch than you can by some you know, oil company that showed up out of nowhere a few years ago. And finally, uh, uh, not, not finally because I have one more, I looked at Baidu. Baidu, of course, technology company, very successful technology company. So I did the same calculation. Their optimal debt ratio is between zero and 10%. And you're going to run into this. Those of you doing a Google or a Facebook or a NVIDIA, your optimal debt ratio is going to be really, really low. I want you to start thinking about why that might be. When I do these debt ratios, what are they a percentage of? And a market value, right? So if you have a company with a huge market value, it's a high growth firm, 10% of NVIDIA's market value would give you about $180 billion in debt, right? The higher the market value of the firm relative to their earnings, the lower the optimal debt ratio is going to be. So when you looked at Baidu's actual debt ratio of 5% when we did the cost of capital, you said, that looks really low. Why don't they borrow more money? The answer is they can't borrow more money. They're already at their cap at a 5.2 or 6% debt ratio. So already you can see with Disney, 40%, with Tata Motors and Vale, we got 30%. With Baidu, we got 10%. I closed the process by looking at Bookscape. And here I ran into a practical problem. I'll tell you what the practical problem is. When I did the Disney calculations for the cost of debt, what did I start with? Market value of equity plus debt, right? That's what gave me the numbers for the dollar debt. Do you see the problem with the private company? I get the debt. There's lease debt but there is no market value of equity. Don't use the book value of equity. It's completely useless. I have to estimate a market value. I'm willing to take a very noisy estimate and estimate that to be wrong. Here's, here's how I estimated the market value. I took the typical PE ratio for book retailers, which is 20, multiplied by their net income, came up with an estimated value for equity of 31.5 million. I know it's shorty, it's, it's kind of a shortcut, but I want to get a starting number of, hey, how much is this business worth? And then I did my optimal debt ratio with that estimated number using a total beta. Again, staying consistent with the notion that this is a private individual and all risk matters to them. The optimal debt ratio I ended up with was about 30% debt, 9.25%. They were at 27.81% using my estimated value. You can see that this approach works for pretty much any company, public or private, small or large, developed or emerging. The inputs will take care of whatever you're concerned about with that company. So I've done five of my six companies. What's the one company I seem to have avoided doing this for? Deutsche Bank, right? And I talked early on about why this is so difficult to do for Deutsche Bank, but I'm going to try to do it. But before I do that, I want to go back to 2017 when the last Tax Reform Act was passed. It might sunset next year for all you know. And that Tax Reform Act brought two huge changes from a debt perspective. One was it lowered the marginal federal tax rate from 35% to 21%. 
So even if you had state and local taxes, you know, that basically means my tax rate has declined. Holding all else constant, what should that do to my optimal debt ratio? Reduce it significantly, less tax benefit, lower tax rate. The other thing that came in with this, which is fairly unique in the first time in the US, you put in a, there was a constraint put in that interest expenses could not exceed 30% of EBITDA. If they did, it's not they, it's not that they couldn't, but if they did, you wouldn't get the tax benefit. If you looked at just those two changes, you say, what will the effects be on debt at US companies? From a practical standpoint, what should you expect to see in 2018, 2019, 2020? If they're borrowing money for the right reasons, you should expect to see debt decrease. So I've been tracking the debt. But I actually took Disney because I was doing this in 2018. I did the optimal capital structure with the old tax law with a 40% tax rate, no cap on interest expenses, the new tax law. And here's what my optimal looked like. My optimal debt ratio itself did not change, but here's what changed. The orange numbers are the numbers with the old tax law. That's what the value of the firm would have been. The gray numbers are the value of the firm with the new tax law. And you can see across the board, lowering the tax rate and putting a cap on interest expenses reduces the additional value that debt can bring. You go back to the example we used, where we came up with a 19 billion, that number will become 10 billion. The incentives to borrow money have decreased. And you can really argue that's it's just plain economics. It's really working it. Okay. And have companies bo borrowing less? No, they're borrowing a little bit more actually in 2019 than they did in 2017. You know, the problem with research is if you squint hard enough at the data, you will always find what you're looking for. So if my hypothesis, let's say I'm writing a paper, but I've already made up my mind that the 2017 tax law is going to reduce debt at US companies. I'm st I want that hypothesis to be true. I look at the dollar debt numbers and say, oh my God, my paper is never going to get published. The hypothesis is not working. I actually computed also a debt to EBITDA number. And that number has decreased. This is the squinting effect. I say, you know what, the total debt didn't go down, but as a percentage of EBITDA, it's gone down. My hypothesis, this is why you should never trust academic research, right? I might not even show you the dollar numbers. I'll report everything in percentage. Remember, I'm not playing the Francisco Gino, you know, messing with the data. I'm just selectively reporting what I want you to see. The bottom line is there hasn't been a massive shift in the way companies borrow money post-2017, notwithstanding the lost tax benefits. Now, we'll talk about what other factors might come in, but clearly from a perspective of traditional corporate finance, the trade-off between debt and equity, there's not been a big change, which is what you'd have expected with the tax law change. So that's the cost of capital approach. As you can see, it's incredibly flexible. You can adapt it to all kinds of companies, but it does come with limitations. And I'll accept the limitations. The first is, it is static. I took last year's operating income. I did the optimal entirely based on that. The world is a dynamic place. That earnings can change. We looked at the what ifs, but in the original analysis, it was a single number. Okay? The second is, I've, in a sense, ignored indirect bankruptcy costs. I brought in the default risk into my cost of debt, but the indirect bankruptcy cost, here's what's going to show up. Remember my EBIT and EBIT stayed the same as I went from AAA all the way down to double C. In a world with indirect bankruptcy costs, what should happen to my operating income as my rating changes? It should go down because at lower ratings, especially if I drop below investment grade, there can be consequences. That's not in there. And thirdly, I am using betas to get cost of equity and ratings to get cost of debt. And there are implicit assumptions I'm making when I use a levered beta. Implicit assumption is debt has no market risk. Everything is borne by the equity investors and that the rating captures the default risk of a company. So I, I accept that. So I'm going to kind of give you a variation on the cost of capital approach. The variation is built into your spreadsheet. So you're welcome to try it out. And here's what the variation does. First is, 
if you choose the variation, I'm going to adjust your operating income based on your rating. There's actually a table I've built in looking at historical data. If your rating drops below triple B, this is how much your operating income will drop on a percentage basis. So now, in addition to your cost of capital changing, your operating income is also going to change as the rating changes. So that's the indirect bankruptcy cost effect. Second is if you truly want to make this dynamic, we talked about crystal ball, right? For investment analysis, we allow things to change. You can actually do a crystal ball and optimal capital structure. We make the operating income a distribution rather than a number. Most of the time, I'm not going to open up a Monte Carlo simulation, but if you run into somebody who says, how do you know, how, how wrong could I be? There is a way to bring it in. So here's what I did to bring in the distress effect at Disney. So you notice my, as, my, as long as my rating stays above AAA, above single A, there's no distress effect. I'm not losing any customers, you know, I'm suppliers. I still... So when I go from A to A, A minus, there's this, you know, and de so depending on what kind of firm you are, whether there's a low indirect bankruptcy cause or high, you're going to get very different levels. As my rating drops, you see that my EBITDA decreases, my operating income falls. And it falls more if you're a company like, you know, Boeing, where you worry about indirect bankruptcy costs. So when you pick the low, medium, high, you're picking on what kind of company you have. And once you pick that, I will adjust your operating income for whatever your rating is. So here's what the optimal debt ratio looks like for Disney with this additional indirect bankruptcy cost brought in. Remember the original calculation, all you did was focused on where the cost of capital is minimized, right? You can't do that anymore because your operating income is also changing. You got to go and look at the value of the firm at every debt ratio. So I've added a firm value component at the end. In this case, it turns out that, and this is pure coincidence, that even if I allow operating income to change, my optimal debt ratio stays at 40%. Why? Because if you remember at a 40% debt ratio, my optimal, my rating was still single A. There's no distress cost. But let's say at my optimal, my rating had been triple B or worse, double B. You'd now see an effect on operating income. Your value could actually be lower even though your cost of capital is lower. It allows you to bring in both the cost of capital effect and the operating income effect. So the enhanced cost of capital approach is not a radical shift away from the traditional cost of capital approach, but it allows for the realist, realistic assumption that your operating income will change as you become a riskier company. So now let's talk about banks. Okay. Banks, as I said, debt is raw material. So if you ask me, what is the optimal debt ratio for Citibank? I have no idea. Why? Because Debt is, you know, everything could be debt. I mean, deposits you put in a bank are technically debt, right? Because the company has to pay them back or the bank has to pay them back. Using that as a definition, Citi's debt ratio could be 97%. So if you ask me, does Citi have too much debt? I don't know. Does it have too little debt? I don't know. But if I asked you a different question, does Citi have too much equity or too little equity? I think you can answer that question. And here's why. Equity to a bank has a very special meaning. It becomes the basis for regulatory capital. What's regulatory capital? That's how banks are allowed to either keep going or get shut down if your regulatory capital drops below a certain premise. So when I ask you, do you have enough equity? I'm really asking a question of, hey, is your regulatory capital okay? So if you do this, will you still be intact? So with banks, basically everything comes down to book equity and regulatory capital. And if that falls below a threshold, the bank's in trouble. So I'll give you a very simplistic example of how this would play out at a bank. Let's suppose you have an old-fashioned bank. You know old-fashioned banks did, right? They borrowed money or took deposits and they lent them out. How do they make money? They made money on the spread. So this bank has $100 million in loans outstanding and a book equity of $6 million. Let's assume book equity is roughly equal to regulatory capital, and it's not, that's not a bad assumption. Their regulatory capital ratio right now is 6%. So they have loans of 100 million, those are their assets they made out, and a 6% book equity. So loans here, I'm not talking about loans that they've taken on. These are the loans that they've given to their customers. This bank comes to you and says, look, next year we're going to have a lot of growth in our loans, a 50% growth. So basically our loan base is going to go from 100 to 150 million. 
And we've looked at the 6% we have right now and we don't feel very comfortable with the Silicon Valley Bank that we saw. I think we need to increase our regulatory capital ratio to 7%. Can, can you see how I can use this information to decide what to do next year? If I take 7% of 150 million, I come up with 10 and a half million. I need to get my equity from 6 million to 10 and a half million. So, if you're this bank, what are the different pathways you can use to get from six million to ten and a half million? What's the most common way companies raise money? Retained earnings, right? So if you make net income of four and a half million next year, you're already home free. Don't pay dividends, take the entire four and a half million, retain it. You will make the extra four and a half million. That's asking for a lot, right? That's a lot of net income. Let's say you don't have enough net income to retain. Then you have to raise fresh equity. This is the, the basis for advising banks. If your regulatory capital ratio is low, and it's not, again, and your income is not enough to get you back to steady state, you have to raise fresh equity. So when you talk about the financing mix question for banks, that's what it boils down to. So since Deutsche is our example, I thought I'd give you a look at their sorry looking numbers in 2013. These got even worse as you got further into the decade. Now I computed their, you know, they were you know, they were at 15.13% was the tier one capital ratio, which is the regulatory capital ratio, mostly composed of book equity. And they were hoping to increase it to 18% because they'd been beaten up so badly by you know, loans and losses and all kinds of things. I computed how much they would have to invest in regulatory capital each year to get from where they are now to where they'd like to be. So this is basically what they will need to re, you know, reinvest, uh, retain in equity each year. They have a problem, they're losing money. They have a net loss. So if you have a net loss and you have to do this, you got to raise fresh equity. So in year one, they'll have to raise about 4 billion euros in fresh equity. Year two, they'll have to raise another 2.6 billion euros in fresh equity. You know, since 2008, banks that were covered by the, 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 by TARP, which was the, the plan that was devised in 2008 to protect banks, those banks that received money from TARP, they had to go to the Fed to get approval on dividend policy stock buybacks. You see why, right? Because every time you pay dividends, what are you doing? You're re reducing your regulatory capital and return for letting these banks kind of make it through the bad years. That was one of the things. In fact, I think it, it, was, it, it took almost until 2021 before the banks were released from that obligation. But in 2017, 18, you were JP Morgan, largest bank in the world. You had to go to the Fed and say, we want to pay a dividend. Is it okay? And the way the, the, the Fed would look at it, look at the regulatory capital and say, if you do this, this is what will happen. We're okay with that. You can pay the dividend. If not, they could stop you. So if you're a bank, because it's about regulatory capital, you constantly. But banks did not get regulated till the 1930s. I think it was Great Depression that brought in these regulatory capital requirements. And banks have been around since the 1400s. I don't know when the Rothschilds created the first European bank, but they've been around since well before you had regulatory capital. So how did they make it without somebody looking over their shoulder and telling them what to do? Well, they adopted a self-regulatory strategy. It's not, I mean, again, it's common sense, right? You know that there'll be big losses. You got to cover them without hurting your depositors. So even if you are not regulated as a bank, you have to maintain a ratio to cover yourself. You know, this is, I think, something that banks missed leading into 2008. They thought this was a game. You know what I mean by a game? The regulatory capital ratio, what can I do to make it look like I have the regulatory capital without actually having it? They created securities that look like equity, but were actually, you, were, you had, contractual claims. And because of the stupid ways in which tier one capital is calculated, you should preferred stock. Oh, it's equity. It increases your regulatory capital. But this is not a game. This is not about you fooling the Fed and saying, look, we're okay. 
This is about you surviving as a company or as a bank through those losses. So the regulatory minimum might be a strategy you can adopt as a bank and get away with it in the good times, but it'll come back to bite you in the bad times. That's why I think all banks need to think in terms of self-regulation. You know the risk of your business is much better than the Fed does. Set aside enough capital in each business to cover bad things that can happen to business. So your trading business might be an insanely profitable business, but it's also an incredibly risky business in terms of exposing you to big losses. Your regulatory capital, if you're expanding your trading business, should be much greater than your regulatory capital in traditional banking. So when you look at, at banks, you, you see the differences between banks that self-regulate and banks that basically play the regulatory minimum strategy. Okay? I would rather, as an investor, be in the banks that self-regulate because they're not playing games around this. This is about setting aside enough capital to survive the next big hit they're going to get. And they are going to get a hit sooner rather than later. So let's close this discussion by looking at why the optimals have varied. Now, why is Baidu's optimal so low? You kind of get it by now, but I want to reinforce it. The first and biggest reason, and this should come as no surprise, for why optimal debt ratios vary across companies is differences in marginal tax rates. If any of you are doing the airline business as your group, and Ryanair is in that group, as is Lufthansa, as is United Air. I would expect Ryanair to have the lowest debt ratio. Do you see why? Because the marginal tax rate in Ireland is much lower than the marginal tax rate in Germany or the US. In fact, in all my companies, I just changed the tax rate to 0% tax rate. Every one of my companies, my optimal debt ratio is zero. If you get no tax benefits from debt, and you're borrowing money, you have to come up with some other reason other than a cost of capital reason. It might be I have no access to equity. I value control. They're not bad reasons, but they're not reasons which are going to increase your value as a firm. They're driven by other factors. No, it's not that it's not important, but whatever you gain by replacing more expensive equity with cheaper debt would be exactly offset by the rise in both of them. It's always going to be proportional because it's the same business, same cash flows. The way in which Merton Miller and Franco Modigliani described, because when they won the Nobel Prize, journalists said, can you describe your Miller Modigliani theorem in common sense terms? And if you were into the board and you started drawing you know, equations, you wouldn't get it. So here's what they said. Look, let's suppose you have a bottle of milk, whole milk. And you look at the calories in the whole milk. And then you separated the whole milk into cream and no fat milk. You know what happens to the total calories? You know, if you, if, let's say you, instead of drinking the bottle of whole milk, you drank the non-fat milk and then you ate all the cream. Terrible idea, but you did. You'd get exactly the same calories. You can't reinvent something by just separating it. And that's basically the logic here. If there's no tax benefit, it's still the same business. The operating risk is still the operating risk, right? Remember cost. Of, so if you're, and changing the mix can't change the operating risk, your cost of capital will be almost immune to what you do with debt and equity. Okay. The second factor that determines why your optimal is different is how much cash flows you have to service the debt. In fact, here's a very simple proxy for how much cash flows. You take the EBITDA you have as a company and you divide by enterprise value, you're going to get very different percentages. Baidu has the lowest percentage. Not because it's a bad company, but because the growth has pushed up the enterprise value. When your cash flows are a low percentage of your enterprise value, your optimal debt ratio is also going to be low. So if you're doing NVIDIA, or even if you're not doing NVIDIA, this is a two-minute calculation, go check out NVIDIA's EBITDA, divided by their enterprise value. Right now, I think it's about 1.5%. And I can safely predict that the optimal debt ratio will be really low because you don't have the cash to service that additional debt. In fact, if you invert this EBITDA to EV, you get this multiple that PE investors and LBO investors like to look at, right? EV to EBITDA. And what's the rule there? You want a low EV to EBITDA company. It's a variant of the same thing. You're looking at the cash flows to service the debt. So your tax rates matter. Your cash flows matter. 
How risky you are as a company obviously matters. Riskier companies for the same income should borrow less than safer companies. You think, where does that show up in my capital structure calculation? First, through your unlevered beta. Higher unlevered betas will lead you to a lower optimal debt ratio because basically everything gets magnified. And the other is through the ratings. If you're a riskier company, you're going to get a lower rating at the same interest coverage ratio, and that's going to play out as well. So those three are the factors. So when you compare the companies across your group on optimals and you get different optimals, compare them on those three dimensions because that'll tell you why one of your companies might have a 50% optimal and another might have a 10% optimal. There's only one macro variable, and this will be the last slide for the day, that seems to affect how much you borrow. Remember we talked about equity risk premiums? I described this as the price of risk in the equity market. And then we talked about default spreads. Think of that as the price of risk in the bond market. So you're a CFO, you're trying to say, should I use equity or should I use debt? Do those prices matter? Yes. In the late 90s, for instance, the price of risk in the equity market went down to 2%. The equity risk premium dropped down to 2%. A historic low. Investors were not seeming to price risk in at all. But the price of debt stayed high, default spread stayed high. So in the late 90s, if you are raising financing as a company, my advice to you is go raise as much equity as you can. It's costing you very little. But by 2006, the reverse was true. Equity risk premium stayed high, default spreads had dropped. Then if you ask me, what should I do? I'd say, go borrow money. The price of risk there is low. This is a number that might affect the overall mix of debt and equity. Right now, we're at a pretty close to a norm, which is the equity risk premium is about twice the default spread. But if that number starts deviating, you can see effects on how much companies borrow. So you have all the ammunition you need to actually do the capital structure section for your company if you are so inclined. I would suggest doing it quickly. It's actually a very quick process. It's not like the, you know, because you, assuming you've done the, this so far. You know, but give it a shot this weekend and see how far you can get. Professor, uh, quick question. When you were going over the impact of, um, I, I just, I don't understand why 